Hey, I'm Christian Bucher, the associate pastor at LFC. I pray that this message encourages you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see that God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. As a kid's pastor, you know, I get to talk with lots of parents. Uh, there's usually every week I'm getting a couple phone calls or emails or text messages uh, from some parents whose kids are struggling, who are having a really hard time. And, and we know that there are people all around us who are going through difficult times. And so I feel like God is very much impressed on me this morning to preach a message that I feel like he's given me that is so timely about how do we deal with difficult times. We understand that as the world gets closer to Jesus's return, there's going to be more and more evil and more and more things happening because Satan is trying to throw every attack he can to try and steer us away from God's plan, right? And so the difficult times, unfortunately, are just going to get harder. I'm the bearer of good news today, right? <laughs> in all seriousness, though, 100% of us are going to experience hard times in our life, Right? A hundred percent of us are going to know people around us who are having difficult times. And so today I want to share with you a message about how can we get through difficult times. Now, remember, my kids are in here today. And so some of this may seem elementary. Some of this may seem simple, but please don't tune me out because I can guarantee that God will speak to your heart through this message. I wore my uh, Raised to Life shirt today. I thought it was fitting, even though it's not bad baptism Sunday, but I thought it was fitting because today I want to preach out of the story of Lazarus. Does anybody know the story of Lazarus? I love this story because it's like one of like the ultimate miracles of Jesus when he was here on earth. I mean, how many people can say they raised the dead and that they've witnessed? I mean, crazy, crazy stuff. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn in our Bibles to John chapter 11, and I'm going to read this story to you. And you can follow along if you brought your copy of God's Word. It'll also be on the screen, I believe. Uh, and it's kind of a long story, so bear with me. But it's important that we understand everything that happened in this story in order for us to dig a little bit deeper in this message, okay? So John chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 1. Are you guys ready? Oh, wow, that was, <laughs> that was very anticlimactic. Are you guys ready? Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm used to kids talking back to me, so you gotta talk to me a little bit. Okay, John chapter 11, starting in verse one. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Do you sense the sarcasm there? On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. 
Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said that, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Come on. That's a cool story, right? You're not gonna just find that in any story, uh, fairy tale book, right? Because we believe the Bible is God's word and that everything in the Bible actually happened. And so this dude totally came back to life. Crazy, right? But I believe that we can learn some things from this story. And I wanted you to understand the whole beginning to end of the story so that we could dive in a little bit deeper together, okay? So how do we deal with difficult times? Martha and Mary, for sure, were going through some difficult times. I think the first thing that we need to remember, and this sounds so simple, okay? Don't laugh me off. But I think we need to remember that Jesus loves you. So simple, right? In fact, it's so simple. We sing it in the nursery with our babies all the time. You as parents may have sang it over your children. Yes, Jesus loves me. Don't listen to my singing, but you get the idea, right? It's so simple and yet it's so easy to forget when we're in the middle of difficult situations. John eleven five 5 says, now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus was friends with these people. He had been in their home. They had a relationship. He had ate dinner with them. They had spent time together. And that's why I find it so interesting what verse six says, the very next verse. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Let me read it together. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. This doesn't make sense, right? This seems counterintuitive. It kind of seems crazy. Let me walk you through the timeline of this. See if you can follow me. Jesus was at Bethabara, which is what was about 20 miles from Bethany, which is where Lazarus and his family was. A messenger was sent with the news that Lazarus was sick. If that man had traveled quickly and without any delay, he could have made the trip in one day. 
Jesus sent him back with a message to the two sisters. Then Jesus waited for two more days before he left Bethany. And by the time he and his disciples arrived, Lazarus had been dead for four days. If you do the math, this means that Lazarus had died the very day the messenger was sent to Jesus and Lazarus was already dead before the messenger had even gotten to Jesus. So why would Jesus not just say the word and in the blink of an eye heal him? It doesn't make sense, right? I believe that Jesus's love is not a pampering kind of love. It's a perfecting love. Because Jesus loves us, He is willing to allow us to go through difficult times so that our faith can be perfected and we can grow in our relationship with God. You see, the word so, according to the dictionary, means and for this reason. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And for this reason, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. It's difficult to understand sometimes God's reasoning for things, right? It's difficult to understand why, why one person is going through difficult times and somebody else isn't. It's difficult to understand why when we feel like we do all the right things, why are we the ones that are going through the hard times when we're the ones trying to follow God and you see other people that are making out better than what you are? Maybe you've got family situations that don't make sense But can I tell you that Jesus loves you? So he waits. It's hard for us to wrap our brain around. We question if he's such a good God, then why? Well, sometimes it's because of a result of of our own choices, right? We can go to God and we can ask for forgiveness, but the reality is, is that we still face consequences for some of the choices that we make, right? Sometimes we suffer and have hard times because of choices of other people, right? I think specifically about kids that I have in my life that other people have made choices that have affected these kids greatly and they're hurting because of it. Sometimes we face difficult times simply because we live in a fallen world where sin and sickness and death do exist, And yet the Bible promises us that Jesus has overcome the world. I can only imagine what Martha and Mary must have been thinking in this time when they were waiting for Jesus to come. They had sent word to him and yet he still waited. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Come on, Jesus is my friend. Jesus has all power. We've watched him do miracle after miracle. And yet he's not doing anything about my brother who's sick and dying. Can you imagine the hurt they must have felt at times? Probably some anger and some bitterness. Right? They're human. However, because Jesus loves us, and because he desires the best for us, and because he is such a good God, and we know that he has good plans for us, can't that mean then that when we go through difficult times, it's because God has a greater plan and purpose than what we may understand in the temporary, right? We know God's good. We know his plans for us is good. John 11, seven through 10, we get into this section where he's talking with his disciples and his disciples don't understand. They've been following Jesus and they think that Lazarus is just asleep, right? He said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light. Now, this was like the equivalent of a mic drop for Jesus, but it sounds very confusing, right? The disciples weren't getting it. I have to read it several times for it to make sense to me too, right? But basically what he was saying, he was like, hey, I'm the light. 
You know, if you're following me, everything's good. I've, I've got it all under control. Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and they still weren't getting it. In fact, they argued with Jesus saying, if Lazarus was only asleep, then he'll wake up again. And so Jesus had to come right out and say, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. And of course, the disciples are sarcastic and doubting and, and our good buddy Thomas doubting Thomas. is like, well, sure, let's just go back and die with Jesus. Come on, you have to appreciate some humor in the Bible. But I love how patient Jesus was with them, right? Even though they couldn't see what he was doing and they didn't understand, he was so patient and loving with them, just how he is with us. When you're going through difficult times, remember that Jesus loves you and that your situation is not a reflection of his love for you. You are not going through a difficult time because God doesn't like you or because God's mad at you. That's not how God works. He loves you perfectly and flawlessly. And he loves you regardless of what situation you're in. Number two, what's something that we can remember when we're going through hard times or maybe we know somebody who's going through hard times and we can be an encouragement with, to them through this. Again, it seems so simple, but bear with me. Number two, when we're going through difficult times, remember to run to Jesus. You see, Mary and Martha had their own idea of where they thought Jesus would be. In fact, when Jesus does come and he waits outside the village, what did both of them say? Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They had their own idea of where they thought Jesus should be. You know, many times when we're going through our situations, we have our own idea of the way that we think Jesus should answer, the way that we think God should move. And if he's not where we think he should be, or he's not working the way that, he thinks, that we think he should, we tend to sit and wallow in our grief and our suffering instead of getting up and going to him ourselves. Right? You guys understand what I'm saying? He doesn't hide himself from us but sometimes he desires us to seek him out. John eleven twenty 20 and 21, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So Mary go, or Martha goes back to get her sister Mary and says, the teacher is here, go out and see him. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Can you imagine the disappointment they must have felt? Yeah, they knew that Jesus was the resurrection of life. They knew that. They knew that one day their brother would rise again. But sometimes that doesn't always take away the pain. Am I right? Sometimes we know the truth, but our humanness still struggles to catch up with the truth of God's word. So I imagine they felt disappointed. I imagine they had frustration and hurt and sorrow. And the way they spoke with Jesus was just a real and raw, like, where were you? I believe that God wants us to come to him in a similar way. God doesn't need our fancy prayers. He doesn't need us to be all put together when we come to him. But I can tell you, there have been numerous times where I've sat on my kitchen floor or my bedroom floor and I have wept and cried to Jesus and I was real and raw with him. And I just said, God, this is what I'm, what I'm going through. This is how I feel, this stinks. Where are you? What are you doing? I think when we go to God with that honesty, there's something that happens in our relationship with God. You know, King David, as he was writing the Psalms, you see so many times that he was like, why are my enemies after me? Have you left me totally abandoned? He's so real and raw with God. When we can run to Jesus, we don't have to put on a facade. We don't have to pretend to be somebody we're not. We can just run to Jesus and say, this is what I'm going through. I need you. It's interesting when you look through the gospels that Mary, the sister of Lazarus, is only mentioned three times. 
And as I was studying this, I found it so interesting because every single time that she's mentioned, she is found at the feet of Jesus. The first time was when uh, Jesus was visiting their home and Martha was busy cooking and cleaning and doing all the chores. And where was Mary? She was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him. The second time she's mentioned is here in the story of Lazarus where she's desperate and she's hurting and she runs out to Jesus and falls at her feet, at his feet. And the third time is when just a few verses later, I believe it's in chapter 12, where she anoints his feet with oil in preparation for his burial. She's always found at Jesus' feet. Why? Because she knew where to go. She knew where she had to get to in order to get through whatever she was going through, whether it be good or bad. She knew that she needed Jesus. You see, it's through suffering and hard times that we learn to depend more on God and less on ourselves, right? Mary and Martha could do absolutely nothing over the death of Lazarus. It was completely out of their control. Have you ever felt like that? Where you've had situations that are completely out of your control. You've done everything you could to make it right, to get through it, but it was out of your control. Listen, I got to tell you, I got a 14-year-old daughter. Parents, you're, you're getting the brunt of it today. I'm telling you, sorry. Not sorry, but <laughs> I want my daughter to know where to go when she's facing hard times. As a mama, I'm going to do everything in my power to protect her, to keep her safe, to help her get through, to help her get through life. But there are going to be times that she faces that I can do absolutely nothing about. And so then what is she supposed to do? I want my kids to know how to get to Jesus. I want that path to be so well worn to Jesus that even when mom is not there, even when there's darkness and chaos and all kinds of stuff going on around, she knows who she needs to go to to fight her battles. Come on, parents, we got to model that. I grew up in a home where Jesus was number one priority. And my mom and dad are here. And I got to tell you, I can remember as a young child going out to the living room in the mornings and finding my mother on her knees, draped over the couch like this. And I hear her crying and worshiping Jesus and talking to him and praying. I saw that. I saw it modeled for me. I can remember going into my dad's offices Cracking the door, he's a pastor, and so there were so many times that he was studying. I can remember hearing him, the mumblings of his prayers, and praying in the spirit, and peeking through the door and seeing the tears streaming down his face as he sought God. That was modeled for me, so that as I've grown up, and I've experienced my own life trials and struggles and things that I didn't know what to do. I knew where to go because it was modeled for me and my parents. Grown-ups, it's on you. If you don't show them how to get to Jesus, who will? If you're not modeling that in your own home, you can't just rely on a Sunday morning experience to get them there. Mary and Martha's situation seemed hopeless. And yet these two sisters knew that Jesus was the master of their situation. And they knew that they had to go to him for answers. The problem is that most people spend their time trying to figure out why they're suffering and focused on their problem rather than how they will respond to their problem. Now, you guys know I'm a kid's pastor, and I always like to bring something fun to show you guys to help illustrate a point. Now, if you're one of my kids, you've seen this, so don't tell my secret. I'm watching you. Don't tell my secret. This is just a simple broom pull. Uh, if, if you go home, you may catch one of your family members practicing this in the living room or something because it's pretty cool. But if you watch, it's 
pretty difficult to balance this stick. You see, many times we get focused We get focused on our suffering. We get focused on our pain. We get focused on our troubles and our trials. And and we have a hard time knowing where to go when we're in the middle of the situation. However, when we fix our eyes on Jesus and we put him as our focus and we go to him. Hold on, I can't talk and do this at the same time. Come on, that's worth a little bit more. Because the trick is, it's not gonna work when my eyes are focused down here on my situation. It only works if my eyes are fixed at the top of the pole because that's when it can actually balance and stay, stay where it's supposed to be. Friends, it's no different than us and our problems and our situations. If we keep our eyes fixed on our situation and our suffering instead of on God, It's not a good mix, right? That was a little more exciting first service. It's all right. You guys go home and practice it for yourself. You're gonna be amazed that you can do it, right? God's plans are not our plans and his ways are not our ways. And so if we focus on trying to figure out the reason for our suffering, we may become bitter and mad at God because we may never fully understand this side of heaven. My focus should be, how should I respond to it so that I can become all that God wants me to be, right? His love is not a pampering love. It's a perfecting love. You see, there are times when troubles seem to serve no purpose and we can find no answers for them in this life. But if they cause us to rely more on God, then when we join Christ for eternity, we will understand. Romans 8, 18 says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. All the sufferings and the difficulties of this time, sickness, pain, disappointment, injustice, mistreatment, rejection, sorrow, persecution, trouble of any kind are considered so small when compared to the blessing and the privileges and the glory that will be given to every believer as we spend eternity with him. Guys, what you're facing is temporary. I know it may not seem like that, You may feel at the end of the rope, but it's temporary. Sometimes it feels like it would be easy to just walk away from it all, right? You don't know what else to do. It's out of your control. Our flesh would say that it's not worth it because God's not moving in the way that I need him to. That's why we have to focus on what we know is true, that God is faithful and that we can run to him, right? Okay, number three. What do we need to remember when we're going through difficult times? Again, it's simple, but simply to remember that God is faithful. You see, Jesus didn't ask them to understand what he was doing. He wanted them to trust him. God is present and aware of our suffering. And Jesus knew Lazarus was going to die even before he died. And yet he said it wouldn't end in death. Listen, I didn't even say this first service, but maybe some of you feel like you have been in a grave for four days. You feel like your situation is so difficult. You feel totally alone. The Bible said that Lazarus smelled because he had been in the grave for four days. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're dealing with, what your family is dealing with, what your job situation is, your finances, your relationships. But can I tell you one thing that I do know? God is faithful. Jesus didn't care that Lazarus stunk. He said, I'm still gonna move, right? Jesus didn't care that Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. He said, I'm still gonna move. And he wanted people to trust him. 
It's interesting to note, though, that even after Lazarus was, was raised from the dead, right? Kind of like the ultimate miracle here on earth. It didn't stop for Lazarus. Because if you look a few verses later, you see that there's actually a plot to kill Lazarus. In John chapter 12, it says, when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. You see, when God starts moving in your life, Satan doesn't like it, right? Satan doesn't like it when God is moving in your life. And even after this incredible miracle where where Lazarus experienced this literally life-changing encounter with Jesus, he still faced hard times. But Jesus was still faithful. You see, friends, God is faithful in our difficult times. God is faithful in our good times because faithfulness is who he is. It's part of his character. He does not change. Sometimes it's after we experience our greatest victories is when we can let our guard down and start to think that we're okay. We're through this situation. We're all good. Because sometimes our humanist think, starts to think, well, I, I did this. I'm, I'm through this. We're, it's good. And honestly, that's probably the part that you are most vulnerable because your dependence is no longer on God the way that it was when you were walking through your situation, right? We have to stay focused on God. You see, when Jesus left earth and he was getting ready to send his disciples out into the world, he knew that his disciples were gonna face persecution and and people were gonna be awful to them and people were gonna reject them and, and try to kill them. And in fact, many of the disciples actually died martyrs' death. Jesus knew this. And because he wasn't physically able to be there with them in body, he said, as he was going to heaven, that he was gonna send someone to help them. He was going to send the Holy Spirit who would be their comforter to be there with him when they were going to face hard times. Romans 8, 26 and 28 says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. You know, we really like to quote this verse a lot, right? We really like to say, God works for the good of everyone who loves, who loves them and are called. We like that verse. But I think sometimes we miss the verses that are just before it because there's so much power in those verses. Verse 26, where it says, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The word helps translated in Greek means... Listen, it means that the Holy Spirit takes hold of our weaknesses together with us and instead of us. Do we understand what that's saying? That when we are going through difficult times, the power of the Holy Spirit, because he is our helper, he takes hold of our weakness, sometimes together with us and sometimes he just takes it right? This means, or I'm sorry, together with us and instead of us as our intercessor. Do you know what an intercessor is? It's one who pleads a case on behalf of another. The Holy Spirit is your intercessor. He is pleading your case. This means that the Spirit joins with us to help and empower us to be victors and not victims in our circumstances. Come on, you guys should be way more excited about that. (laughs) 
The Holy Spirit takes on our weaknesses. He is our intercessor. The Bible says that we have two main intercessors, mediators, ones who plead our case and take responsibility for our needs and situations. It's the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father currently. Right, the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings. Have you ever had moments where you, you were so upset and, and you literally had no words to say and it was like you felt it in your gut and it was like a groaning and a will. Have you ever felt that? That deep inner depth groaning. Listen, the Holy Spirit works deeper than we can ever imagine. The Holy Spirit intercedes and prays for us with groanings, means that the Holy Spirit communicates with God the Father through our desperate inner cries and the longings of our heart when we don't have words to, be, to adequately express our needs and desires to God. Let me explain this a little further. When we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit operates in lots of different ways. He has lots of purposes in our lives. But one of those ways is that we receive a prayer language that we've never learned, just like the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't a one-time event. It was part of the pattern of the early church, and it's for us today, that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we pray in that special prayer language, it's a perfect prayer that prays the perfect will of God. And so when we don't know what to pray, when we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can pray in that heavenly language that he's given us. And it's prayers that are, that are like the deepest and inner groanings of our lives, right? Of our hearts. And they're perfect prayers to God. I mean, that feels like a win-win situation to me, right? When I'm at a total loss and I don't know what to do, I have the Holy Spirit to be my helper, Verse 28, the one that we like to quote all the time is God will bring good out of all difficult, or I'm sorry, that verse 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God will bring good out of all of our difficulties, our troubles, our persecutions and suffering for those that are faithful to him. You see, there's, there's a little bit of a, uh, a, not a glitch, but like there's, there's something to remember with this promise, right? He promises to work out the good for those who love him, who have submitted their lives to him, right? The all things promise doesn't necessarily include our sins or our negligence to follow God's will. You see, we, can ex we can't excuse sin by claiming that God will work it out for good. In fact, we will often experience consequences of our sin, right? We talked about that earlier. Temporary consequences of those sins, even after asking for forgiveness from God. Yet when we truly turn to God, he can still work out his highest purposes in our lives, no matter what our failures are. You can come on and play. Thank you so much. It was interesting because uh, as I was listening to Pastor Daryl's messages uh, these past several weeks, I, I don't typically get to hear them live, <laughs> but I do always listen to them uh, afterwards. And I, you know, he's been preaching on healing of the spirit, soul, and body out of 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that, that we would be made blameless, right? And I find it so interesting the way that God works because this entire month, our kids' church curriculum, mind you, Pastor Joel and I have not talked about this. And so this was set, totally set up and ordained by God. But our verse that we've been learning in kids' church this month is found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Kids, will you help me say this? I know that now it's like, oh, she's talking to me. I should pay attention. <laughs> It's the verse immediately following that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. Right, that's a promise that's in God's word. That when we are following him, when we are running to Jesus, regardless of what situation we're in, God will make this happen 
for he who calls you is faithful. You're not in it alone, friends.